Jane Austen was an innovator in the field of novel writing. What she wrote was in line with, but also against the grain of, contemporary fiction, as she experimented with new techniques. Uh, we could even go so far as to suggest that she invented a certain type of modern novel, thanks to features such as the uh, original use of dialogue and conversation, her reformulation of realism and new ways of narrating interiority, to name but a few of these features. Her dealing with uh, uh, fiction, her idea of dealing with fiction, is based on remaking. And to illustrate this point, let's consider a passage from chapter 16 in volume 2 of Pride and Prejudice. Here, two of the younger uh, Bennett sisters, Lydia and Kitty, talk to their older siblings, Elizabeth and Jane. Uh, they invite them to lunch. We mean to treat you all, added Lydia, but you must lend us the money for we have just spent hours at the shop out there. Then showing her purchases, look here, I have bought this bonnet. I don't think it's very pretty, but I thought I might as well buy it as not. I shall put it to pieces as soon as I get home and see if I can make it up any better. This passage does not just provide further evidence of the voluble characters, the flightiness of the younger Bennett sisters. Nor is it just a token of their unthriftiness or superficiality made explicit by objects and their consumerist tendencies. If we read it elusively, in this passage, Austen crystallizes the way in which she deals with fiction. She is Lydia, the bonnet is the novel. Austen takes a traditional format or, or formula or subgenre, unravels it, pulls it to pieces, Lydia says, and then reinvents it to see if she can make it up any better. Austen, therefore, follows patterns and at the same time disrupts them. Uh, if her fiction broadly falls within the category of what the critic Gary Kelly has called the novel of manners and sentiment, by using this pattern, she variously rewrites the Gothic novel in Northanger Abbey, the contrast novel, in Sense and Sensibility, or Pride and Prejudice, the moral domestic tale in Mansfield Park, or the regional and the national tale in Emma. As she rewrites, she subverts conventional features. For instance, the happy ending, the final ideal marriage based on complete mutual understanding and happiness. In the conclusion to Emma, the narrator declares, Seldom, very seldom, does complete truth belong to any human disclosure. Seldom can it happen that something is not a little disguised or a little mistaken. But where, as in this case, though the conduct is mistaken, the feelings are not, it may not be very material. That of Emma Woodhouse and George Knightley is a very good match, but the narrator is warning us that there is no perfection in human life, both at an individual and a collective level. After all, Austen did not believe in perfection. As she wrote to her niece Fanny Knight in a letter of late March 1817, pictures of perfection, as you know, make me sick and wicked. This remark and several others we can find in her extant letters, a little over 160 in all, tells of a disobedient author, one who seems to submit dutifully to rules and mandates, but in fact surreptitiously undermines and subverts them. And this is why we need to pay attention to details in Austen, uh, to pay attention to what we could call her inscription of the minute. As she explained in her very well-known definition of her writing as the little bit two inches wide of ivory on which I work with so fine a brush as produces little effect after much labour. A famous sentence she uses in a letter to her nephew and aspiring novelist James Edward Austen in December 1816. Jane Austen saw her writing strategies as in many ways diverging from what other contemporary writers did. In the same letter to her nephew she talks about strong, manly, spirited sketches, full of variety and glow, 
as being the opposite of what she is trying to achieve in her fiction. These strong sketches may also be a reference to what Walter Scott was doing at that time. Uh, in point of fact, Austen was very much aware of how successful Scott's new type of historical fiction was. Uh, though obscure, she saw herself as a professional author, and so she monitored competition carefully. In 1814, in a letter to her niece Anna Austen, she wrote, half ironically, Walter Scott has no business writing novels, especially good ones. It is not fair. He has fame and profit enough as a poet and should not be taking the bread out of other people's mouths. Scott was familiar with Austen's novels and he himself acknowledged this difference uh, as after her death he wrote in his diary in 1817. The big wow-wow strain I can do myself like any now going but the exquisite touch which renders ordinary commonplace things and characters interesting from the truth of the description and the sentiment is beyond me. The same went for women writers because Austen kept an eye on them too. In April 1811 she wrote to her sister Cassandra. We have tried to get self-control but in vain. I should like to know what her estimate is but am always half afraid of finding a clever novel too clever and of finding my own story and my own people all forestalled. Uh, Self-Control was the latest product of Scottish author Mary Brunton, a successful work by a well-known female writer. When Austen eventually managed to get hold of a copy and read it, she found the novel full of implausibilities and this fact reassured her. Brunton's work was no competition, since it was utterly incompatible with Austen's own brand of realistic writing. In general terms, Jane Austen's approach to fictional representation is based on two principles, selection and focusing. Her driving principles are also simplification, reduction and suppression. She avoids sensationalism, or rather, she moves sensational events from the centre to the periphery of her narrative, as the main plot is sometimes accompanied by a hidden second plot. Writing to her niece Anna, who was asking for advice on how to proceed with her own novel, uh, in a letter dated September 1814, Jane Austen comments, You are now collecting your people delightfully getting them exactly into such a spot as is the delight of my life. Three or four families in a country village is the very thing to work on. And I hope you will write a great deal more and make full use of them while they are so very favourably arranged. Truth be told, Austen does not always conform to this pattern. Emma is the best instance. But other novels, Persuasion, Sense and Sensibility, stray from this formula, and successfully so. Within this setting and context, Austen places a heroine who has to undergo a process of growth and maturation. She is a perfectible heroine, going through a process of formation. For this reason, Austen is often considered as one of the inventors of the 19th century Bildungsroman, together with Goethe. And especially in her later fiction, the character's path to self-knowledge is structured by means of the technique of free indirect speech, which is a type of third-person narration which contains features of first-person narration. That is, an external viewpoint that also gives us direct access to the character's own point of view. The aim of the process of formation is to enable the heroine, but also often the hero, to achieve discrimination, which Gary Kelly defines as not just a set of social codes and languages, but as the central practice of the self engaged in society. So, the ability to discriminate means being critically alert, choosing carefully, reading and knowing accurately, behaving and interacting appropriately. Austen, however, is also a mistress of the comic novel. Her fiction makes us smile, grin and laugh outright. She is a mistress of humour, irony and sarcasm. 
Humour, for instance, when she crafts a statement that induces us to laugh, an overtly amusing statement, and we have no uncertainty about its meaning and effect. In Pride and Prejudice, let's see what the narrator says about Charlotte Lucas, Elizabeth Bennet's good friend, and her ideas about her husband, or husband-to-be, Mr. Collins. Her reflections were in general satisfactory. Mr. Collins, to be sure, was neither sensible nor agreeable. His society was irksome, and his attachment to her must be imaginary, but still he would be her husband. Very often, humour pervades Austen's inimitable dialogues, heavily influenced by her familiarity with the contemporary stage, and innovatively employed to develop character. Very often in these dialogues there is a large amount of funny repartee, just like in the so-called laughing comedies of the time. At the beginning of Pride and Prejudice, Mrs. Bennet explains to Mr. Bennet that she is planning the future of their new neighbour, Mr. Bingley, as the husband of one of their daughters. She says, You must know that I am thinking of his marrying one of them. Her husband replies, Is that his design in settling here? To which she answers, design? Nonsense, how can you talk so? But it is very likely that he may fall in love with one of them. Sarcasm associated with harshly humorous remarks is also present in Austen. Again, in Pride and Prejudice, for example, when uh, the narrator describes Mrs. Bennet as a woman of mean understanding, little information and uncertain temper. Then there is irony, which is one of Austen's most expertly honed strategies. Irony intended as the formulation of an indirectly amusing statement, a form of indirectness by which one says one thing to mean the opposite. Again, in Pride and Prejudice, the famous opening sentences are pervasively ironic. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. However little known the feelings or views of such a man may be on his first entering a neighbourhood, this truth is so well fixed in the minds of the surrounding families that he is considered the rightful property of some one or other of their daughters. Though voiced as fixed truths, these statements are not to be taken at face value. If we read carefully, we can see how the universal truth of the first sentence is ironically undermined by the progressive narrowing down of the second sentence. To conclude, uh, Austen's remaking of the novel, her pulling it to pieces to see if she can make it up any better, is carried out through focusing on a restricted slice of reality. A close examination of social, economic and cultural mechanisms. A consistent use of dialogue to reproduce her accurate observation of social interactions. Moving the sensational, the extraordinary or the unusual into the background and shifting the everyday to the foreground. Privileging the process of formation of personality, both as inwardness and in relation to society and so ultimately through a type of narration that readers can identify with, as it mirrors and mimics the experience and context with which they are familiar. All of this is, to a large extent, what continues to attract new generations of readers and viewers to Austen's fictional universe.